So welcome everyone, my name is Cassandra Zerke and today I'll be talking to you about communication skills, the topic being translating research into education, policy and practice. So we'll start today by looking at what we mean by education, policy and practice and how each of these elements can be translated. In terms of education, of course, we've got both formal and informal education, but increasingly, even in layperson zones, we are recognising that this should all be evidence-based. So under formal, we've, of course, got peer-reviewed publications, lectures, continuing health professional education, both medical and other health professionals for registration purposes, as well as seminars and not so formal training. And of course, textbooks, which is used for medical school and um, health professional school training. The informal based educations, which should also be evidence based, are things like community talks, seminars, teaching in schools, um, but also, as I mentioned, tertiary education based models of updating education. I thought I'd start with the first of these because this is the one where everyone sort of says people publish, but they don't translate. So, you know, what do we really mean when we say publishing? And of course, we mean these peer review articles, um, which means it's an article that has been assessed by specialists in the field, has been determined to be both publishable, but also of high quality and reproducibility, or it just doesn't meet the criteria for publication. And there's a very high rate of rejection of these sort of papers. And of course, the high impact the journal, um, the more rigorous it is um, to get into those journals for publication. And that's usually what we mean by a peer reviewed publication. And we consider this, I guess, the highest level of evidence in terms of that evidence based education. Problem is, and you know, these are two of my papers that, uh, as was the other one, two of my papers that I have um, put into graphics to show how simple the message of my papers were. But, you know, even so, you can see with our, um, you know, three-way statistical analysis of the mediation model and our uh, neat little tables, this is still not really the best way to communicate um, with the public. Then, of course, we have these wonderful um, metrics where you look at a publication and you see how many citations there were, how many people captured your article, how many people mentioned it, and then, of course, the alt metrics. And the alt metrics include basically news mentions, references, blogs, people who might post. It also incorporates Facebook, Wikipedia and Google. The thing is, it doesn't incorporate all of these, and particularly in some countries, it's not well represented. And, you know, this is one of my top papers, which has, you know, uh, over 1,500 citations, but you'll see its altmetric score is 584, and I'll compare it later with another publication I'm far more proud of, actually I'm proud of both of them, but... Um, which I think had much more influence, which has a similar old metric score, but not even as high as this one, but I think had more influence in the field. So, of course, the other part is textbooks. And, you know, you cannot go to uni even nowadays. They may be online textbooks, but textbooks are incredibly important and a really good way to shift um, education and thinking when there's been a paradigm shift. So, you know, this is a textbook where we uh, actually did quite a paradigm shifting chapter in the textbook where we looked at the fact that, in fact, um, and this is this is decades old now, but we now accept that the most common dementia is not Alzheimer's dementia, it's mixed vascular and Alzheimer's pathologies. And this was a textbook chapter we wrote to basically convey that in the early days over a decade ago. And this, of course, is used in medical school teaching. It was even translated into Spanish. So, you know, getting that wide distribution is really what you want in medical textbooks, because obviously English is hardly um, the only language. So when you've got education, you then want to move into policy development. And, you know, there's three elements to this engagement, um, guideline development, and then dissemination. The importance of engagement is including all stakeholders, Guidelines, of course, need to be co-developed and co-designed and evidence-based. 
And with dissemination, obviously, there's various uh, networks and circulars depending on your target audience, which could be anything from community to health professionals. Um, and of course, uh, utilizing things like the Department of Health website and endorsements um, can also really help with those guidelines. Um, there's not much more for me to say on this because we actually have this wonderful guide to the development and implementation of any clinical practice guidelines that was developed by our own NHMRC and it's relatively recent. And so we really have kind of set um, those ways we like to influence guidelines and policy through that. What I was gonna raise with you guys today is that ultimately we're not writing guidelines for guidelines sake, we're writing them to move these into practice. And this is where my talk takes a uh, quite significant turn and shift. So in fact, what's the evidence that all these guidelines and there's been a great deal of them in the last 20 years, what's the evidence these are actually taken up? So if we look at Australia and we look at our national MBS data for health assessment items for adults over 35, we can say this. Well, the leading cause of death in Australia is heart disease. The current Australian guidelines say that if you use the absolute cardiovascular risk assessment, which is available on the Department of Health website, on the Heart Foundation website to all GPs, and if you use that as a guide to prescribing medication for high-risk patients, you could save $5.4 billion a year and the associated personal and individual costs and community costs of that pathology. However, in this audit, just done in 2023, only 17% of Australian patients have those risk factors recorded to enable doing an absolute cardiovascular risk assessment. So you can see whilst the evidence is there, the support is there, the cost effective analysis has been done uh, and the information is widely available. Everyone knows how to get that risk calculator um, and yet only 17% of Australian patients are getting that data recorded that would enable um, the data being put into that risk assessment. So it's not being done. Um, when we look uh, at Australia again, World Health Organization recommends front of pack nutrition labeling. We developed our own star system. We implemented it widely. Isn't it wonderful? However, um, 2020, there was an audit. And what was interesting was basically because it's voluntary, people with low quality products are not using the STAR system. So if you look uh, as they did in a proper research analysis, they found that the products that were displaying the logo had a much higher mean of a health risk STAR system than the products that were not displaying the STAR system. So the only people who were taking it up had high health STAR ratings and the people with the low health STAR ratings were basically just not utilising this labelling system. And, you know, 2020, again, there had to be mandatory star system um, ratings was what was recommended. But this is very, very hard to implement. And, you know, finally, this is going a little more global now into, you know, really big health research policy systems research and the recent Lancet paper um, just showing that, Ultimately, um, there is huge bias in terms of um, implementing any guidelines. Um, there are a number of barriers and um, facilitators, and the barriers are really implementing the influence. Um, and so you can see here negative attitudes to implementation, lack of knowledge, sociocultural belief, all of these things can limit the implementation of guidelines. And then in terms of even the facilitators of guidelines, um, inconsistent leadership, lack of commitment of mem some members in the team, and the administrative and technology support to implement guidelines are all factors which are resulting in a low uptake of guidelines that people have worked very hard and done, you know, considerable research um, to achieve. And you can see, you know, in the Lancet, just looking across all the rigorous evaluations, only two of 11 um, had significant improvements, um, not just in uptake, but actually outcomes. And again, you know, there's such variability in people not taking up the guidelines the way they're meant to. So, you know, at this point, we take a little hiatus where, you know, as the title of the talk was given to me, it's all about translating your research 
educating, policy, practice. That's what it's all about. But I think um, research has evolved to a stage we have to reconsider how we do that because it's not as simple as publish, educate and write a guideline. It's not that simple. So what I want to talk about is publications that influence rather than publication with the sort of NHMRC metrics, which, and I understand the mismatch there, that obviously for NHMRC, we need to have the metrics, um, but influence is probably more important in terms of policy and practice. So, you know, this is me, and there's that top paper that gets plopped out there um, when you, you do your H index, and, um, you know, cited by more than 15,000. This is a paper that we basically looked at risk factors across the world. So, you know, I would say to you, I mean, it's great that 15,000 people cited it and so it pops up as my top, but they were not citing it with any influence to what they were doing. Whatever they were doing, they wanted a global Lancet um, publication saying risk factor is important and they used this one because it was the most recent. And so really we had no influence specifically on the research that the people who were citing my most cited paper were doing. Comparing then to this paper that was written uh, as a PhD project a couple of years ago, it's not even a hundredth in top of my top citations. It doesn't even come in um, in the top 100 citations. However, it had enormous influence in the field. So it was a PhD student who actually did this work. And as all PhD students do, they do a big systematic review at the commencement of their studies. And in looking across the last 32 years before she started her PhD, she found 14 papers existing in the literature about grandparenting and cognition. And for anyone who's done a, a Google search, uh, a PubMed search, you know of those 14, some were cellular or animal studies that weren't relevant to the topic. So in fact, there were even fewer than 14 papers that looked at this. And then after she did her thesis, published her papers, you can see this explosion of publications looking at grandparenting, looking at generational integration in terms of improving cognitive health in older adults. And so the influence here um, is really significant. It was an entire area of research that had basically not even been uh, looked at. And then it became really prominent. And, you know, next thing you know, we have uh, kids going to nursing homes as a TV show. So, you know, the influence here, I think, is what's really important. Um, it ended up uh, on Fox News. It had a lot of uh, international interest because it was a topic that people were socially interested in and wanted to discuss. And as you can see here from the quote I just popped up, you know, in the field of geriatrics and gerontology, social engagement is an idea and kinds of social engagement is really hot right now rather than treating people with pills. So it was this sort of influence that meant a lot of people took this up. A lot of people looked at it. And whilst, as I mentioned earlier with my top Lancet paper, you know, we do have a good altmetric score here. But you'll notice even the altmetric score is actually not reflecting the fundamental seismic shift in attitudes to grandparents looking after grandchildren or older people interacting with young children. Um, it's not reflected in 516. You know, the top paper was 586 and really had, I think, quite little influence in terms of fundamentally changing the direction of where we're going with risk factor research. Um, so really the metrics we're using at the moment are maybe not the best and, you know, things will change. Altmetrics have just come out and at least this paper is not in the top 100, but you can see it is in the top 50 in terms of altmetrics. So there is a pivotal shift with the new inclusion of altmetrics. And this is helpful, but nevertheless, I think there are other metrics that we should care more about and we should start looking at those. So the other thing to talk about is publicity. So it's one thing to write a paper and a lot of your colleagues could read it and a lot of other researchers could do similar research. But ultimately, if you're not getting it to the end user, then sometimes that research can just keep spinning on itself and you keep citing each other in the field. So whilst publicity is something a bit scary um, for academics, I think it is actually really important. And the other great thing about publicity 
is that you engage the community in actually feeding back to the research you've done and pushing it in different directions, which um, as academics you mightn't have considered. So, you know, when I talk about publicity of papers, um, it is actually a seismic shift in the difference between writing your paper and talking about it. So if you want to get publicity around your paper, you really have to think about making infographics because these are the sort of stats that are the one-liners, the short um, sound bites that you can convey that will attract someone to actually interview you or ask you about your data. You can also utilise uh, as a first step, and I think this is really important because every academic organisation, and this is a paper from when I was at University of Melbourne, every academic organisation now has their own little publication. And this is a great first step, I think, for academics who um, might not go to the Herald Sun, um, but using your own academic institution's connection to community is a really good way to get started. You have um, entire control to some extent of what goes forward. It's a great learning process because what you might put forward, you can see here the brilliant Cheryl Critchley wrote this paper and um, the edits she made to the, the information I gave were just unbelievable believable and it's a great learning course to see how someone trained in media and engagement with community communicates things that you thought you were communicating to lay people um, so they really teach you a much better way to express which of course is wonderful when you end up on the other line with ABC radio <laughs> because you can take that knowledge with you in answering questions in the most appropriate way. And then, of course, there's going out, out to all media. Um, and, you know, a lot of our articles, uh, once taken up locally, have actually gone international. And, you know, there's issues there with um, uh, changing uh, uh, languages and especially you know for me I'm not very good at any language other than English and so it's hard for me to um, make sure that everything's correct um, but it's just so important and we've got of course TV radio print and the cloud um, we've done all of these sort of media things in our program and I, I wouldn't say any one over the other I think um, diversity is key and doing everything because that gets you the greatest breadth um, and I'm happy to take questions on any specifics about these um, at the end. So what about textbooks then? Because, you know, we still, as I said, online textbooks or not, we still do utilise textbooks um, to teach. And there's been so many paradigm shifts. They're coming so quickly. How do we get them into textbooks, especially when textbooks sometimes take five years to get on the shelf, by which time they could, in fact, be out of date? So I showed you what I did, you know, 20 years ago, popping a little pivotal chapter within an existing textbook well known to be given to all um, clinicians. Uh, but what we've done more recently is create an entire textbook just on the pivotal seismic shift that we wanted to convey. So this is an international group who um, really were looking at women's, it's called the Women's Brain Project. It's an international consortia. Um, predominantly led in Europe, involving really the whole world. And um, what we did here was work with Elseva to make a textbook entirely around the paradigm shift we wanted to convey, that there are sex and gender differences in the brain. And so you can see there, um, I mean, I wrote the chapter on hormones and dementia, but there are chapters on brain architecture, chapters on brain neurotransmitters, um, there's, you know, a whole heap of knowledge which was coming through in the research but had not got into textbooks yet. And so that's a way of really making a paradigm shifting change to education to put an entire textbook out, which is giving new information different to what's out there. Um, I, of course, couldn't leave without uh, not talking about layperson books. I am no expert in this space. I've only written one, um, and it was written during COVID when all of us did odd things that we don't usually do. The problem with a layperson book from an academic or clinician perspective is uh, there is no metrics that NHMRC acknowledges for layperson books. When you're writing a layperson book, there is a degree to which you have to uh, not be entirely clinically accurate 
because um, the, the devil is always in the detail. And if you try to get too complicated in the detail, then people won't understand the message. So there's a degree of simplicity, which um, I found the most uncomfortable as a clinician when having to um, get, deliver messages. Um, but I really think it has a role. And in terms of this, you know, there is a distinct role uh, with layperson. And I think with our new world where there's 10,000 reports every five minutes coming in saying this and that, uh, ground force movements are seeming to get a lot more traction than they used to, um, given there's every foundation and uh, expert centre is uh, giving so many submissions now to government. I think actually ground force people um, are having more and more influence, which of course is excellent because ultimately that's who we're trying to help is um, people in the community. So I think by writing a layperson book, you really can engage the very people that you're wanting to help. So look, what I did was, um, as I said, it was COVID. It's, it's a long story why I wrote the book, which I won't bore you with today. But suffice to say, you know, the study that I had taken over uh, as director had been going uh, at that time during COVID at 2022, marked the 30th year um, of longitudinal follow-up and 32 years since the commencement of the project. And so we really, you know, as, as the chief editor put there, who commenced the study, Professor Lorraine Dernstein, you know, it was a summation of what we've learned over the last 30 years. So not just in the research of that cohort, but really what we'd learned from being academics and studying women's healthy ageing across those 30 years. And look, from that, I would tell you, this is uh, one of my academic slides that I take to conferences where I explain that we did a general linear mix model uh, examining all of the risk factors across 30 years to see um, what was the most important uh, for uh, cognition. And we found that, in fact, simultaneous uh, and lagged effects were not influence, but the cumulative effect was highly predominant. Um, but when I put this in the layperson book, look at this, they gave me a cartoonist. Now, I've never worked with a cartoonist in, you know, 30 years of medicine. Um, but I got a cartoonist because, of course, that I just said to you, which I'm sure a number of you understood, is incomprehensible um, and a lot of jargon. And this beautiful cartoonist uh, was patient beyond beyond reason um, and she worked with me to understand what it was I did and I told her well we asked them a word list and then we came back 30 minutes later and we said okay how many of the words can you remember and we wrote them down and in explaining this for hours with her she came up with this beautiful beautiful graphic which basically said if a woman is going shopping with 10 um, items on her list if she does an extra category of physical activity, she'll get an extra item remembered on that list. And if she has a, a really high good cholesterol, she'll get an extra item on that list. And if she gets two more levels of education, she gets an extra item on the list. But if her blood pressure is too high, she will lose something off that list. And this woman here, she, her blood pressure is too high and she forgot the milk. And so um, I, I really found that a great experience. And as I said, when you work with your media office to get messages out um, to community, they teach you so much um, in terms of expression. And likewise, working on a layperson book is enormously helpful to make you better um, at communicating your science. So um, this is the book that I published. Uh, it was listed in the top. 10 bestsellers um, in its publication year, and it was also best-selling on Booktopia. Um, there was an enormous number of events that surrounded the book, especially obviously in International Women's Day and Women's Health Week. And um, Melbourne University Publishing actually did uh, an incentia uh, report for me, which I attempted to put into NHMRC <laughs> because I thought, you know, we should be counting these things, um, which basically quantified the reach that the book had. And what they did was show that it had a reach of over um, almost one and a half million. And it was equivalent to an advertising space of over $300,000. And that didn't even include the public events or social media because they couldn't capture those. Um, in 2022, uh, the University of Melbourne's, uh, Melbourne University Publishing turned 100. And as part of celebrations, they actually um, gave an award to best-selling titles in various genres. And in fact, this book was the best-selling title in 100 years um, in the genre of health. And we also got a highly commended award in the Educational Publishing Awards. 
which was really nice because I don't think anyone's done research. Um, the, the other uh, nonfiction books were certainly not research based. So it was really nice because in their highly commended award, they said it was an excellent example of long term research that provides real world advice to the wider community. And that was certainly our intention. So um, we're quite happy with that. Um, this is another example of my brilliant cartoonist. Uh, for many, many years, I'm a consultant neurologist and a lot of what I talk about is brain health. And I do get invited to a lot of female conferences because the leading cause of death in women is dementia. Not just here in Australia, in uh, UK as well. It's second leading in US because women die of heart disease more than dementia in the US at the moment. Um, but heart disease is declining and dementia is rising. So that will change soon. I'm always talking about how women's health is brain health. And I've always um, got a photo of a brain up there and people who are coming into these women's health conferences think they're in the wrong place. And I see them scuttling in, looking at the brain and going, I must be, this is not a women's health conference they're walking at. So I love this one where she, she basically said, you know, women's health is not bikini health, it's burkini health or wetsuit health from top to toe. So, you know, we talked about policy and I've already given you all the data on how even if you can achieve policy guidelines, Department of Health guidelines, um, uh, they're just not taken up. And even the SDG goals that we really did sign on to and we signed on to these um, some time ago and they were audited in 2020. And unfortunately, we had not even met the, we only signed on to three of the goals, which was weight, smoking, um, and physical activity. And we were unable to actually even meet those in the latest audit. So, um, you know, that doesn't go so well. So I really wanted to talk about uh, another angle, another angle to policy with you guys. So this is where the public and policy kind of connect. And so I, I've written here policy through politicians. And I think we've seen some really incredible pivotal um, changes in health. I mean, pivotal changes in everything, but I'm a doctor, so I'm going to talk about health, um, where we saw people like Jill Hennessy, who um, was uh, had a passion area for looking at um, voluntary dying. And, um, you know, if you can get a politician with a passion area or convince a politician, which must be through education, which is evidence-based, and very straightforward and simply relate. If you can make it relevant to them through the passion area or by showing that financial issues, social issues, or groups that that politician is aligned with um, would, would find this very relevant. Um, do not go into a politician's office with oranges when they want apples. Make sure you make it relevant to them. Um, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes sometimes we make because if we're a consumer, we think about how it's important to us. If we're a doctor, we talk about the, the cost of the patient, cost of the community and the poor health and, and illness. Um, what's really important is there's lots of numbers and lots of data and lots of stats and lots of issues when you go into policy through politicians to align it with what the politician considers important. So if they're interested in apples, align all of your information and education and stats around apples. And then the final thing is to be solution focused. So, um, you know, you couldn't imagine the number of uh, issues people bring to politicians, let alone the ones they create for themselves. Um, so be solution focused. So propose an action, make sure that you have considered timing. And, you know, what am I talking about timing often as consumers or clinicians? Uh, academics, we think timing is now, now, get it fixed now. But I'm talking about timing in terms of election year, budget timing. Think about their timing, what's important to them, which is, you know, all around getting elected. Um, so make sure you're, you're thinking of a timing that will actually help them as well as getting what you need. Obviously, cost and uh, I hate to say ribbon cutting opportunities, but there it is. And that goes along with timing. Um, so make sure, and sorry, I, I am a basic scientist by trade, so I just, people always talk about solutions, but sometimes I never see that they kind of outline, you get this and you add this and that will fix it. And that's sometimes what we have to do, whereas we're very good about articulating the problems. I think um, particularly when you're trying to get the attention of someone who uh, is very busy and has many things to do, um, being very clear about a solution. Um, and how that can align with things that they need to achieve is the best way to go forward. 
So through politicians, we can get things like mandatory guidelines. We can get things like enormous amounts of funding. And these things we have seen shift pivotally and quickly, much better than the guidelines that just sit on the shelf and don't get utilised. So when I talk about education, you know, what am I really talking about? So I think, you know, when you're approaching to really translate beyond um, explaining to someone what the problem is, what we're talking about, and I've given the example of Alzheimer's disease here, is conveying um, not just Australian data, but also global data to make people understand. And, and you know, this uh, slide here is showing how many drugs have been tried for this disease and yet none are successful. There's only four approved medicine and none of them actually change the underlying disease. And then we go on to explain that from that same chart that usually there's about 15 drugs tried for every one that gets launched and put on that shelf for people to take. And in Alzheimer's disease, the going rate is 120 to 1, which is clearly different and clearly needs attention. So having, you know, our data is all in tables um, and in experiences, but being able to graphically depict it in a way that makes them understand. And this one, again, showing that, you know, dementia, the rate of dementia doubles every five years after the age of 60. And then if you look on the left there, you can see the age increases globally. So you can see that over 65 year olds are due to increase by 200%, over 85 year olds by more than 350%. And our centenarians, we're gonna have a thousand percent more centenarians in the next 30 years. And then explain therefore, um, along with of course the economic, um, health economic costs, which are always important. So um, the other thing is, and this is where I'm integrating um, uh, these sort of stats and data with a publication. So this is uh, a Lancet Neurology publication um, that we did with international collaborators, um, where we showed that basically dementia doubled er, um, in the last 25 years. Now, you know, the, the um, paper was actually very much about uh, the increase in dementia, the sex differences, that women have more dementia than men at absolutely every age, so it's not an age effect and so on. But what we did was we took this into pursuit with the big headline, the number of dementia cases has doubled. And so this is how you can leverage evidence-based, very meticulous research, and then talk about this impact, which we did just before um, the uh, dementia-specific research grants were um, coming through. So uh, take politicians' apples. Um, whilst, you know, I did mention there's a lot of reports and so, you know, it can get a little bit uh, difficult. One really good thing to do is to collate them. So here you can see, again, in my field of dementia, there's the International Alzheimer's Report on Women and Dementia, the UK report, the uh, American report, um, and all of these reports you can bring together and don't bring them reports, they won't read them, but just the front covers are brilliant because they, they know they're all 100 page reports and they're seeing everywhere in the world has done this and yet Australia hasn't focused on, on women and dementia, but UK has, US has, Europe has, the international um, consortia has and this is another really good way to get attention. And then, you know, finally, there's nothing wrong with round tables. Um, really good thing about them is to include everyone. So to have all stakeholders at a round table rather than just having clinicians or academics or um, health services, having everyone is really good. Um, and having um, some media people present. So with this Global Council on Brain Health that was run, this was international, but we actually had a cartoonist come along and they um, did little cartoons about all the talks that were given, whether they be from lived experience or from the academics or from clinicians. And it made it really nice because it brought it down to pictures, which everyone could understand. And then you get this um, sort of it's time to act goal which everyone can understand and is really clear so you know um, to, to get to the end of my talk uh, because I want you to really have a bit of a discussion with me around the integrated approach I'm about to discuss with you um, a community-centered approach to research translation is really really key 
and it can augment research in ways you can't imagine. So I told you that my proudest, you know, the proudest, best research I think we've done is on the grandparenting and cognition. So I will tell you that I didn't create that research idea and nor did any of my colleagues and nor did a student. We have a volunteer thank you day, as you can imagine, for incredible people who've been involved in research for more than 30 years. And we have a suggestion box there. And other than some issues around the quality of our carpets <laughs> um, in our offices where they get assessed, um, there were 12 people who actually wrote, you ask me about my sexual function, my medications, all my medical history, and yet you don't ask me about my grandchildren. They're a really big part of my life. So that research topic was actually created, invented by the people who were our research participants. They're the ones that created that question themselves, which is why I guess no researchers had ever looked at it before. And then when they asked us to look at it and we did, everyone started looking at it. It just shows that having that community approach and um, being involved with people is so important and can bring genius things to life. Um, so, you know, to conclude, uh, and sorry, this is oversimplified, but simple is the best way to always go. It's really important to have an integrated approach, not that kind of stepwise where we see there's the research and then it's translated into policy and then it's uh, translated into practice. It really is an integrated approach where you have ground force movements from community, uh, evidence based from academia and clinicians. Um, efficiency is the target for services which of course incorporates a whole heap of dot points under that. And, you know, government being really important to align with um, their strategies to get support. Because as I said, when I discussed the evidence showing the lack of uptake of guidelines, it's when you don't get the support from government. It's when you don't have efficiency, you need um, extra funding, or as it said, you need some extra technologies to be able to be efficient to implement those guidelines. Those are the things which make it not work. So it's not just about introducing in one direction, as you can see here with the circles. When you go to the health service and you're trying to implement, if they need technology to implement, it's about that feedback and continuously evaluating uh, in this integrated way to be able to get great research translation. So I'm going to stop now so that you guys have got a chance to ask me questions. Obviously, you guys have been using the chat. You can put your questions in the chat and they'll get read out to me so I can answer those. Um, or otherwise, pop up your hand now and I'll be happy to take any questions. Cassandra, the, there is a question though that I have. Um, in terms of um, education and training for you to be able to uh, communicate to the lay person, was that provided um, informally or did you undertake a course or, or were you coached? So I've been around a long while. <laughs> so I actually have done several media courses. So the university is uh, really, really good at offering that. I did a media course when I was at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, uh, which was designed for the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, I also did one through the University of Melbourne, and I've done subsequent tailored, very specialised media courses. But I have to be honest, and I, I'm not saying they weren't great. I think they were absolutely great, really worthwhile. Um, but the best training I ever had was trying to battle with uh, the local editor of the Pursuit or Monash Has the Monash Lens, um, you know, trying to battle with this editor, trying to get me to change my words. And when they get you to change your words, you say, no, no, but that's not what I mean. And it was those battles that really, um, I felt, improved the ability to communicate um, the most effectively. So the other thing I was um, expecting people to ask me, actually, is how do you um, cope with interviews because uh, it can be very scary. Um, luckily in medicine, what I love about medicine is, and health in general, um, is it tends to be bipartisan and everyone tends to be on your side. So if you're improving people's health, um, usually your interviewer is not hostile to you. So um, in general, you don't have to be so scared. 
Um, but the principles that I've learned from politicians actually about how to manage difficult interviews. So sometimes an interviewer, you'll be talking about improving health, but they'll want to push you to say something that you don't want to say. And so having a really clear message that you know what you're going to say and making sure you stick to message and don't get derailed is really, really important going in to ease any nerves. And look, I've certainly been misquoted um, just last year. Uh, I was being interviewed about um, dementia and the interviewer asked me about um, uh, uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump and uh, did I think that Joe Biden had dementia and, you know, what do I think about the discussions around whether or not he had dementia? And so I segued the question into what I was talking about, which was risk factors for dementia. And I said, and they were saying, you know, Joe Biden's this age and Donald Trump's this age. And I said, I really don't care about their ages. I think the age is far less relevant than their risk factors and um, things like whether they've had head injury. And, and I gave this big long list of the seven risk factors in the Lancet Commission. Of course I did. But when the article came out, it was a typed article, um, they actually quoted me as saying, I care a lot, you know, if I'm asking about Donald Trump and Joe Biden, she cares a lot about more about whether they've had a head injury, which was a total, you know, misquote of, of what I had said. So you, you do have to be very careful. We've had a comment, um, uh, Cassandra, about loving the, um, the idea of using uh, the cartoonists. Yeah, well, I have to say something on that, actually. So um, if you're lucky enough to be at an academic organisation uh, rather than an institution, um, so, you know, the hospitals maybe not so much, but um, or research institutions not so much, but at academic organisations, we are mini universes. So we have arts departments, we have graphics departments, we have music departments. There's some amazing stuff being done in terms of music and health with collaboration between the departments of music and medicine, which you know you never would have heard of 20 years ago. And I think actually we have to incorporate um, the arts a lot more, especially you know within arts, there's a lot of digital arts, which I think we can collaborate much more widely. We all think uh, multi-center, multi-collaboration is all about different types of health professionals, but I think we should be collaborating much more widely for us to get much better translation. Oh, yes. Could everyone please complete the evaluation? Um, it'll pop up on your screen as soon as you exit, and it takes less than two minutes. So, so please do that for us so we can continue to improve um, and take your feedback.